I've been using Jupyter for years in my teaching, on videos here on YouTube, and presentations I give. But recently I've heard about a new different kind of notebook, something known as Marimo. It's an open source notebook run by a company of the same name, and they call themselves the future of Python notebooks. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to Marimo, show you where it's the same and different from regular Jupyter notebooks, and why it's actually pretty intriguing. I'm going to start using it in Bamboo Weekly and elsewhere. So first of all, if I want to use it, I'd better install it. So I can say pip install minus big U to upgrade Marimo. But actually, I've been lately using UV pip, and I say minus my system because I don't have a particular project here. It'll download it, it'll update it, it'll install it, we're doing great. And now I can say Marimo just by itself on the command line. And look at this, it gives me a whole bunch of introductory text, like what I do next. And here it says you can type Marimo tutorial intro. This is a great place to start after this video, of course. Great place to start to learn about Marimo, what it does and how it works. But I'm not gonna do that now. Instead, I'm gonna say Marimo edit because I want to start up Marimo in the mode of creating or editing notebooks. But look at the next thing they suggest. You could say Marimo edit notebook.py. It is a PY file. Marimo notebooks are written in Python. The file format is Python. They are stored as Python variable definitions and function definitions, which is pretty amazing. This is a very Python centric project and it works in Python. And so it means you don't have these odd IPY NB files. It's just Python files. But I'm going to say now Marimo edit. It's going to open up a tab in my browser. Just a moment. It actually starts pretty quickly. And I'm going to click on create a new notebook. Okay, great. And so I can get to work right away. I can say x equals 100 and y equals 10, 20, 30. And I can say here, def hello of name. I can say return and watch this. As I'm typing, it auto completes and gives me documentation. Return of, we'll say hello name. And by the way, if I say name dot, well, it's not gonna work there, okay. So I execute this with shift enter just as per usual. And now I can say, what is x? I can say, what is y? I say y dot, and it'll show me all the methods I can use and their documentation, which is what you would expect in an IDE, but less so in a notebook. I can even say, of course, x times two, or y of minus one, that works great. And of course, I could say hello world, or hello Ruben. All working great. Notice, by the way, that the results come above the code. I'm still getting used to that. It's a little weird, but okay, I can deal with it. Here, though, is the thing that makes Marimo totally different from Jupyter. The variables that we defined up here in the first cell, they're not just sort of abandoned. We didn't set them in the past, and that's that. Any change to these variables is reflected later on. So if I change x not to be 100, but 2, 3, 4, and I do shift enter, look at this. This cell got updated, and this cell got updated. If I change y to include 40, 50, and I do shift enter, now this cell gets changed and this cell gets changed. We're getting 50. And if I change my function definition to have three exclamation points and I do shift enter, well, look at this. The calls to hello world down here also get updated. Okay, that's pretty amazing. Although if you come from the world of spreadsheets and you know that things are linked, cells are linked, it's not that surprising. But for anyone who's been using Jupyter for a while, wow, that's pretty great. There is, I don't want to say a downside, but there is a caveat associated with that. What if I say now in a new cell, x equals 999, I do shift enter. Can't do it. You can't do it. Marimo requires that you only define a variable or assign to a variable in one cell, one cell. You can't redefine variables. And that's because it keeps track of where the variables are. If we go over to the left, there are a whole bunch of little control panels here, and I click on explore variables, it'll show me every variable where the variable was defined in which numbered cell and which cells then use each variable as well. So if I update Y, it knows, oh, well, that was defined in zero, but it's going to affect cells two and four. If I update hello, it's going to update, need to update cells five and six and so on and so forth. Really, really clever, but it takes a little getting used to. If, however, you're using pandas and you're using um, method chaining, which is basically a functional technique, then you don't have to worry about so much because you're not going to be assigning anyway to your data frames. But if you're used to reusing the same variables again and again and again, uh, this might be a surprise and be a, be a problem for you. And their suggestion is wrap it inside of a function. That's what they say here. Uh, that's not always appropriate, but it's not a bad idea. Speaking of data, can I load up data? Of course I can. 
import pandas as pd. I'm going to say here my file name equals, and here, watch this, it's going to try to autocomplete users, Ruven, courses, current data. I'm going to say New York City taxis from let's get uh, July 2020, because there were not that many taxis then. And then I can say df equals pd dot read csv and i'll say file name file name i'm going to say engine equals pi arrow for two reasons first of all it's faster and second of all because then it will pick up the dates and times and why is it not letting me do this here oh because i didn't put the parentheses in the right place there we go and there we go and i do this and it reads it in by the way if it takes a long time to execute a cell it'll give you a little timer here along the way, like to show you what's going on. And here it tells you how long it ran anyway, 281 milliseconds, fantastic. If I say df head, we can see then pretty good. And thanks to the pi arrow being the engine, it automatically picked up. These are date time values, that's pretty good. But in general, it's kind of nice. This is kind of like a polars thing where we see not only the name of each column, but the D type for each column, pretty snazzy. So I don't have to constantly be saying df dot D types. Or I can go over to the left to the data sources and I click on DF and I see all of the D types and all the columns right here. It also summarizes, it says there are 800,412 rows. Pretty great. So what happens now if I want to, let's say, uh, well, watch this. I'm gonna actually right here, say then uh, this, and I'm gonna say dot set index to be TPEP pickup date time. Day, oops, date time. There we go. And now it's gonna take a few more moments. It will be updated here. See, now the pickup date time is indeed our index. And now if I say something like df.lock of 2020 to 2020, let's actually do this at like 0000. And then we'll say 2020 0701 at 0001. That's still gonna guess a lot of taxi rides. Oh, value slicing based on non monotonic Okay, so I have to actually, uh, let's do sort index to make it monotonically uh, increasing. Very good. And look, the head just bounced up. It works. And now we have 10 rows. These are all the taxi rides that took place between 00, zero at midnight and 01, the first minute. Okay, so far so good. It was kind of nice to have that bounce back like that. Right now, what if I want to get information about some columns? Can I choose some columns? Sure, I can say here like passenger count, and I can say trip distance, right? I can say like dot describe, something like that. And sure enough, I will get the information back about those uh, different columns. Fantastic, right? Now, what if I change this a little bit? What if I say up here, you know what? I'm gonna set two strings. I'm gonna say start time equals 2020, 07, 01, 00, 00, 00, and end time equals 2020, 07, 01, 0001, just like I had before. But now I'm going to execute that. And now I'm going to replace these. I'm going to say dot lock is going to be start time until end time. And that works just great. And I get these two things. And I get the describe, but I can now change it. I can say, well, actually, I want it from 705 to 710. And now it'll give me different values, right? It'll give me, actually, there's not going to be much there, but fine. All right, oh, I wanted 0, 7, 10, not 110. There we go, now I'll get some things back. And you can see that this very interactive way of using Marimo is really convenient and useful. Okay, let's do a little bit of plotting. For example, what if I just copy this? And now I can say, let's do passenger count trip distance. And now I can say dot plot dot uh, uh, scatter. I'll say X equals passenger count. And I'll say Y equals trip distance. You can even get rid of that there. All right, and it's going to give me a scatter plot. There is no relationship between passenger count and trip distance. Let's do maybe trip distance and total amount. That's a little more interesting. And sure enough, we see the scatter plot there. Well, okay, except for this one guy who paid like a ridiculous amount of money. Fine. Oh, trip distance was more than 200,000 miles. That seems a little unlikely to me. But you can play with all these things again and again. It's highly, highly interactive. Okay. One or two last things about Marimo before I let you go. Number one is, as usual, in notebooks, you can use Markdown. So I click here on Markdown, and I say now, right, this is a headline, and it updates, and I can say, you know, this is monospace and emphasized and bold text. And it works just fine. I can say here, you know, smaller headline. Then I can say first, 
and second and third and this one has several minor things so i'll do like you know one uh sub thing a and two sub thing b and sub thing th thing c and we see that it is being displayed as we use it which is kind of nice and then i can shift enter and do that but there's another way to do um to, to do markdown in marimo i can do what it's suggesting to me repeatedly import marimo as mo and now I say mo.md. And now I can say, I can just give it typically a triple quoted string. And I can say, this is a headline. And this is first and second and third. Right? I can do exactly what I did before. If I do shift enter, then that runs. And this function gives us the markdown. Why would I care? Why is that useful? Well, remember that I can use not just a triple quoted string, but a triple quoted f string. What does that give me? That gives me the ability to interpolate variables. And I can say now, in case you're wondering, a, uh, x equals that and y equals that. And now when I run this, look at that. It gives me the values of x and y from before. And if I go up and I change x and y to be 2, 3, 4, 0, and 50, 60, 70, I run that. Oh, it didn't like that very much. x was also defined by, oh, ha, ha, ha. I still had that there. Okay, let's get rid get rid of this. <laughs> Where did I have that? Hello, here we go. This, I'm gonna get rid of that. And now I can go back here and I can rerun it. There we go. And now everything is updated. And now I go down here and look at this. Look at this. My markdown has been updated. Or mark up has been downdated. No, my markdown has been updated. Anyway, Marimo has tons and tons of really cool functionality. I'm really having fun playing with it. And I encourage you to take a look at it as well. I will be using it in Bamboo Weekly this week as well. So if you want more practice and stuff with Marimo, take a look there at bambooweekly.com. Let me know what you think. Comments, questions, suggestions are always welcome. Like and subscribe, and I'll be back real soon with lots more about Python and Pandas.